joining us today on the Everyman Podcast is an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of Get Good Drums. He's a podcaster from the Grammy. He's a fashion icon. He's for for me at least. Uh, that's why I'm wearing my. I don't know if you know. This is why I'm wearing my V-neck shirt was in honor of you. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the many ways you've inspired me, my friend. Uh, Thank you. Drummer <laughs> from the Grammy nominated periphery, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Halpern. Matt, how are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. I'm humbled. Thank you. Hey, very, man. Uh, very cool to hear all those accolades that you know that I carry around with me day to day. Day to day. You you are <laughs> you're a man of uh, of many hats, you know, literally and uh, figuratively, and uh, you know it's an honor to to, to finally get you here uh, on the cosmic and joining us in the Cosmic Canoe on the Everyman Podcast. So, um, you know, one of the things that it, that this show is about that the reason why Daryl and I started this this podcast was to really connect the dots, so to speak, for for the young every man and the young every woman out there trying to be the the kind of the master of their domain and just, you know, totally taking their own destiny and, and driving towards it. And when I started to think about who, you know, exemplifies the everyman concept, you were one of the first people I thought of just from my, my personal experience. Now, I've taken many lessons from you. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. We've gotten to know each other. And, um, you know, so tell us right off the bat, what are you? Are you a businessman first? What do you think of yourself as? I, I definitely, I, I mean, I, I identify as a drummer because I'd say out of everything, that's what I've been my whole life since I can remember. Um, and it's usually the easiest thing in some circles to say <laughs> when people ask me what I do versus there's other times I just say, you know, I have a, I have a software company, you know, yeah. depending who I'm talking to. But I think when, when most people ask me, I say I'm a drummer. That's how I identify you know, and you know, kind of on the topic of, of that, um, you know, Daryl and I, as, as I've gotten to know Daryl, you know, and, and he's introduced me to all these other NFL players. I, I, from a fan perspective, you think like, wow, these guys are all super specialized in what they do. And, you know, they're kind of tasked to a certain role. But then when you, you start to peel back the layers a little bit and you find out that, like, no, I was a linebacker and then I had an opportunity here and then they said put on some weight and, like, it's all – and then, you know, all the, all the things that go with it is very much kind of like a show business type thing. And, um, you know, one of the things that you hit on there is, like, you know, you're, you identify as a drummer, but you're not like a metal drummer. You, know, you always made this point that you're, that you're a drummer first and you're not kind of throwing yourself into this category of you know, genre-related things. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why you've been so dynamic with your, your kind of fan base and everything over the years. You have to be. Um, I mean, it, with music in particular, at least when I was not in periphery, right? When I was doing session work, when I was playing cover gigs, when I was playing with you know, different session bands, you know, I, you, you are a drummer, you're a drummer and you're a chameleon. If you're going to do it successfully, you have to, uh, you have to be ready for whatever the job entails when the thing that's most important is playing drums over anything else, you know? And then if you get lucky, you end up in a situation where you can play the music you really want to play and it's your own and it's original. And you, you know, it's like being on the team you always wanted to be on, I guess, and playing the position that you're best at, which is always everyone's dream no matter what the uh the actual job or or you know uh landscape is that's the goal right so you just do whatever you got to do until you get there hopefully it's it's a marathon you know and one of the things uh i learned you know from from jamie king was like in the music industry and just really entertainment in general i mean really life i guess somebody comes to you with an opportunity they're like hey can you do this and you're like, yeah, I can do this. And you're like, yeah. even if you, even if you haven't learned the music yet, totally. And I'm not saying like, take it easy. I'm just saying, take that chance and and go in that direction. If somebody says, hey, you want to join a metal band, and you're like, hey, well, I've been doing all these hip hop gigs or whatever. Look, look how it can turn out for yeah. you. Yeah, you, well, you have to say yes, um, as long as it's something that can, if you if you have enough foresight to think about where it can go, and you can be open minded. Saying yes is one of the things that makes luck happen, in my opinion, mm. right? You're going to have opportunities that present themselves to you all the time. Um, you have a decision, yes or no. If it's something that can lead you to a place where you want to go, or if it is that opportunity, even if you're not fully ready, you're better off taking advantage of it and learning real fast, you know, than you are 
wavering and letting doubt get in the way or excuses or other things. I mean, but that's the difference between people that are willing to take the, the risk and make the sacrifices to say yes, even with the fear and the, the, the questions that are there and the people that like to stay safe. Yep. And there's no, there's, there's no wrong way. Everybody has their tolerance for risk yep. and for those kinds of, of, of decisions. But I've always subscribed to, you know, take the risk, say yes, go for it, even if you're not ready and learn as you go and use your strengths, whatever they are to get there. And you're right. I mean, that's Jamie King is very much correct in saying that <laughs> if you want to be successful in, in this business or really any entertainment or sports, I mean, sports are it's entertainment, you know, um, you have to do that. You yeah. just you have to you have to go for it. And know? it's hey, Matt. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Hey, Matt, so when, when you say like, you know, and I'm just trying to equate this in my mind, because the one, one of the cool things about being on, we, we call it the Cosmic Canoe, is that Brother Jay is bringing me in to this musical side of things that I had no knowledge of. Right. So me and you, it's flipping awesome for me. And I'm like a kid in a candy store because this is like the first time I'm getting, you know, getting sure. a chance to kind of be in on this. So when you say chameleon as a drummer, do you mean like like. Like, I remember when I was in Baltimore and I was like, hey, listen, you know, uh, Rex is like, listen, you have to be able to play all positions and sub packages as well as our main defense. So do you mean like, hey, I have to be prepared to say yes to those opportunities, but also be ready with a skill set that can kind of, you know, jump in there at, 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 the, at the drop of a dime? Is that, is that what you mean by that? Yeah, uh, yes. I think initially it's more so saying yes to different kinds of bands. And just to give you an example, like in any given week, like when I, before I was in periphery, um, when I was when I was working primarily as a musician, like session session musician, um, my weeks would look really really different from day to day. So like one day I'd be in the studio and I'd be recording jingles for a friend of mine who wrote like you know tracks for adverts and things like that, and then that night. I'd be playing with an original band that was playing like pop fusion-y stuff. And then the next night I'd be doing a cover band where it's all top 40 and like acoustic rock. And then the next day I'd be playing in my metal band with, with a few of my best friends, so on and so forth. So it's, it's not only like specific to genre, but it's also specific to the arena in which you're in and knowing, I guess what I would compare it to is like knowing your role in each situation as well as being prepared to play as well as you can in each situation. And, and I guess what I mean by that, it's like sometimes you're the support person and you're there to make things happen, you know, for, for somebody else. And then other times you're, you get to shine, yep. but you have to know the difference of, of when to pull back and then when to unload, you know? And, and if, and if I can, I want to, I want to jump in right there because <clears throat> what, what you're saying there is something that, I, it took me a while to learn once I started playing with other people on top of my original music. And it was that this is not when I, when I got hired as a, as a musician, as a hired gun, come do this tour, come learn this music. And I became an employee. I was no yeah. longer the fucking show director and the guy and the project manager and just the whole thing, the merch guy. Like I was just the drummer and it was the weirdest thing for me at first. Like I, I couldn't, I, I just was like, what is this? This is wrong. And then I realized, like, no, what I was doing is just not the norm for every situation. So, you know, the only way you learn that is by playing with other people. And one of the things I want to I hit on, you know, I talked about taking lessons with you. And um, I kind of want to go over a couple of things that's interesting. So this, this is something I've never done on the show before. So this is my, my journal here. And I had this book when I was and all the lessons that I've taken with you over, over the years. And I actually, I took some notes and there's a couple of things that I, I took, you know, in 2013, 2014, and I, I continue to apply them to my life overall. And, and not only that, but there's, there's things I quote about that you've taught me over the years um, that I want to kind of elaborate on it from the source. So, you know, like one of the things right off the bat was like starting the conversation with the audience. And this is from, July 25th, 2014. Okay. So you said, you know, start the conversation with the audience, playing with conviction and emotion. And, and a show is a conversation with the audience and the, and the musicians and the musicians together and the musicians to the audience. And this concept of like the give and take that is live performance. And one of the things right now that's impacting everybody, 
obviously, you know, these uncertain circumstances is, is, the, is COVID and live music. And that idea of the conversation with the bandmates on the stage, communicating yeah. out with passion to the audience, and that, that passion and energy that comes back on the stage. Um, what, what are your, you know, for me, looking back at those, at those notes, it just really hit me in a completely different way now than when I wrote it. And um, I wanted to kind of get your idea, your thoughts on, like, on that idea that you said in 2014 to me in my notebook, uh, yeah. you know, with the, with the, with the 2020 vision. Uh, well, it, it's still definitely <clears throat> my main focus when I go to play a show is to have fun and to let that energy come across to the audience and to inspire them and to give them a good time and to connect with them so that they connect with each other. Just like I said before, you know, it all, it's, it, it's, it feeds off everything in, in the, in the room is synergistic, right? So if I'm having a good show, my bandmates are having a good show, my bandmates are having a good show, then the audience is going to see that they're going to have a great time. It, they're feeding us energy. Yeah. We're feeding them energy. It's a beautiful thing that you really can't replicate. So, given the state of the world right now, it's absolutely a palpable feeling to, you know, missing that, like not only missing that, um, but knowing that it's going to be a while before that comes back. And that's just a pill that you have to swallow. And it's, it's interesting because there's some people that I know in music that are having a very hard time with that principle, with that, with that idea, with that acceptance. Um, and I understand it. In fact, more than ever, I've really chosen to be compassionate and empathetic and not blame people right now for the things that they're feeling, even if I don't necessarily feel the same way. Um, and, and one of those things right now is just accepting that this is the reality and there's nothing we can really do about it. And right. are you going to be sad and bummed out and complain and not do anything about it that, you know, while you have this other time to focus on, or are you going to actually like make the most of it? So to kind of come back to that idea, it's like, it sucks, man. I miss everything about it. I miss being on tour, being with my friends, um, connecting with the audience, meeting people, teaching lessons on the road, having coffee at my favorite spots, going out to different restaurants, what every little detail of it, you know, sleeping in a bus, moving <laughs> constantly, never, never stopping. I mean, I miss that. You, you really start to love it, but uh, it's the way it is. And that's fine because I, I've never been the kind of person to just sit around, you know, no matter where I am, I kind of never stop. Um, and, and with that in mind, I hate to say, it sounds so like simple, but my life hasn't really changed that much from this. The only thing I'm not doing is going on tour. And frankly, we weren't going to be on tour for a while. Anyway, we got really lucky and I don't want to keep rambling, but I'll say this. We finished our tour in Feb It was February 16th in New York city, came home, COVID hits. The only other thing we were supposed to do was a festival run in June in Europe for like two weeks, which it sucks to miss those, those great shows. Huge but shows that too. Was huge shows, but that was the only thing. And the thing is, it's not like just, it's not like we were missing something. Everyone, Every yeah. Slipknot got canceled it. too. Yeah. Everybody. So it's fine. <laughs> but then beyond that, dude, like we were supposed to take at least a year off to write a record. So luckily everything lined up for us to where I had already kind of planned this time to be off, to yeah. be able to focus on other things, to be able to focus on writing. And I guess it wasn't that much of a shock to me. And I will say the, the part that stings the most is the uncertainty of when we will be able to get back out and play shows again. Uh, but I try not to wallow in that. And I just try to focus on what I can do today to be stoked and what I can do today to connect with the same audience that is also missing the shows. You know, we're all in it together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can get, it can get played out like, but it's true. And, and Daryl and I, from the beginning, we've been saying that, you know, and from, from, yeah. you know, way, way at the beginning of this podcast that, you know, the idea of this is that we're, we're all cosmically kind of intertwined and you're connected in a weird way. And it's like, 
you know, every everybody we have on, there's some way it's like, oh yeah, you know what, I am a Ravens fan, blah blah blah. And next thing you know, it's like you're you're yeah. bros, and and um, you know, you've said a lot of things there that you know, we've we've had the opportunity to have some of the best, my opinion, the best drummers in the world on this podcast, Kenny Arnoff, Mike Mangini, yourself now, you know, Blake Richardson, Naveen Copperweiss. Uh, so if you're listening to this podcast for the first time, maybe check check that stuff out in the archives. You'll definitely learn some stuff uh, from those those great gentlemen there, um, but. You know, everybody, like all those people that I mentioned right there, they all are saying the same thing and have said the same thing to us, which was, what am I going to do, sit around and, you know, I'm no, I'm going to work, I'm going to get it done. Yeah. And like that, that idea, that, that is like a, is a state of mind, in my opinion, um, is, is why you're able to do all this stuff from, from an outsider's perspective. And like, that's, you know, the reason we're, you know, you, you we were messaging, you're like, oh, is it audio only or video? I'm like, it's audio and video. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. We took that time where I was off from work and Daryl had some extra time from NFL Films and we did all the production. We got the cameras and we got the, the OBS going, like all that stuff because we realized yeah. like, hey, when am I going to have 40 hours a week, like, you know, in the in next immediate future to do this? Probably not for a while. So right, right. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's great that you, you know, I mean, you walk the walk, dude, you know, you're one, there's a lot of, especially now on social media because like things have changed. Um, you know, since the first time I met you and spent time with you to now with social media, but you, you know, have been consistent in your messaging and, and like how you present yourself. Whereas there's a lot of, not specifically in the music world, but well, I don't know, but in social media in general, there's a lot of people that yeah. just kind of like put this kind of bullshit out there and they're not really about it. You know, like the, the hard work, the positive, the positive, you know, outlook on things. Um, you know, so it's just really it's refreshing to, to hear you're, you know, you're, you're, you're really doing it, man. Thanks man. Yeah. And just as a, as a side note, so I don't know if you guys have ever talked about this, but Daryl, so you work at NFL films, two, two quick things. One, my dad grew up in Philly right down the street from where the, where the initial headquarters uh-huh. was started in like a, I mean, it was like a tiny little spot. Um, and so he grew up knowing Steve Sable. Ah, uh, there you go. And, uh, and then, Fast forward a bunch of years, I joined this band Periphery, and the previous singer of the band is Casey Sable, Steve's son. No way. <laughs> yeah. So, and how, Casey, how crazy yeah. is that? Cosmic Canoe, baby. See what I mean? It's the Cosmic right. Canoe, man. Right. There you go. So, And Casey is still one of my best friends. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he lives in lives in L.A., makes music. He's an incredible songwriter, incredible singer. And is a gig- dude. He's huge. He's a big dude. He's like my height, six six four, and just gigantic. And it ran in the family, obviously. You know, his dad was a strong guy. So it's just funny, man, because there's there is that connection. Yeah. That was just so random. Like my dad knowing Steve and his dad, and then I somehow end up becoming really close friends with Steve's son. It's just it's very serendipitous and and strange, coincidental. Yeah. You know. That's Cosmic. Awesome. We expect nothing that less at this point. Awesome. It's uh, <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah, and and you know the funny thing, like just kind of on the topic of that is, when I met Daryl for the first time, I got to NFL Films, and you walk in, and there's this there's a very large statue of Mr. Sable, and and then you walk in there, and I was like knowing what I was there to talk about, and I'm like, oh man, this is like this is crazy because you know I, I grew up. I grew up watching all that NFL film stuff, you know, and all the music and the and the the just the that's the difference you know to me for the nfl and other sports and um yep. it was just a uh, surreal experience to that whole that whole process and then seeing it you know on television it's crazy oh, yeah. so yeah i've heard i've heard some stories just from casey and it's it's you know to him it's like what he, where he grew up you know he grew up in this stuff but it's uh it is legendary i mean it's unbelievable what what nfl films did and how that came to be and what it is now Oh, it's well, just, look, it's, they've it's it's everyone else. Everyone's oh, yeah. copied them for the most hundred percent. You know, yeah. you know I mean, like it, yeah. NFL films. You know, obviously made the um, the the handbook for like sport storytelling. Yep. I mean, a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Every amazing. Everyone that that like that's what they picture in their mind. They picture something that was from NFL films, oh, yeah. and it's and it's oh, usually yeah. that that sticks in your mind, not the actual actual game footage you remember some slowed down special version of it it's it's just it's just art man it's just like music matt you know brother jay you guys have, are, are living it have lived it are, are still living it dude it's, yep. it's 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 overwhelming art i yep. love it 
It really is. And, and, and what a cool thing to like, to, to work in that aspect of the field now, like a chameleon, you're not out there playing right now, but you're still producing for this huge entity that helps to depict everything that happens in the sport. That's pretty nuts. Well, I tell you what, you you hit it on the head when you talked about you know the the synergy that's involved with what it is, the fans, and then you know the the ambiance, the environment of uh, wrapped around what it is that you do. And for me, when I stepped away from the game, and I'm not gonna keep going down this rabbit hole, but when I stepped away from the game, the number one thing I wanted to do was stay around it. And uh, Michael Sinclair was my defensive line coach when I was out in Canada. Uh, long, long, long time great defensive end for the Seattle Seahawks back in the day. He said, listen, if you take care of this game, the game will take care, take care of you. And I've always took, taken care of the game. I've always been a student of the game. And just like Brother Jay has with music, I'm, you have it with, with, during, throughout your entire career. And, you know, music is taking care of you guys, taking care of you guys. Football is taking care of me. It's that synergy yeah. For, for, uh, yeah. for me. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, everything I do around the band, around being a drummer, is is, is in music, right? And if I, if I, for some reason, could never play drums again, right? If, if, this, if this COVID thing destroys the music industry and we can never play shows ever again, I'll still work in music. I'll still be a drummer. I'll still identify as that. There's so many ways to still serve and connect with the audience through music, even now at home. And there's so many other things around music that you can get creative with and do to, to, to as you said, respect the sport, respect the game, respect what it is that you love and, and work within. Dude, I, I totally agree with you, Matt. If we didn't have games, if we get if everyone gets furloughed from NFL films and I lose my job tomorrow or before the season, I'm going right back to a high school out here and I'm giving back to these kids because yep. I still love the game. It's yep. still within me. It yep. just means you have to pivot. That's yeah, it. Yeah, and it, it and it that's the thing. It like doesn't really matter. Like w- again, using this word, the arena is. It doesn't. It doesn't matter as long as. And, and that's the thing that, that a lot of people lose sight of. Yep. Um, you know, they they. It's only good if they're doing it at this certain level, and that's that's again what why I don't really feel the effects, you know, uh, of this situation because. I can go, instead of playing a show or a festival or whatever it is, I'll go in my basement and I'll just record some jams and put it out there and get messages from people being like, man, I'm so glad you're posting videos. Thank you for doing that. It's, it's this, you know, and it, with teaching, it's like I'm not only going to teach clinics. You know? <laughs> There's got to be 500 students right. or I'm not exactly. coming. Exactly. I, right. I don't care. I'll, if I, you know, I do have some students still that I work with one-on-one. Um, of all ages, I work with groups, I'll do it anywhere, just like what you're saying, it's like, I would go back in a second, if I needed to, I would go back to my high school, I would go back to, you know, any local place that needs help and get back that way, 100%, because it's, art, it is about the art and the love, yeah. The art is in your craft and how you curate it, it's the Absolutely. art is in your craft and how you curate it, I, again, Again, I don't want to keep going down this, but I literally, if it all stopped tomorrow for NFL films, as much as I've learned uh, from, from from Steve Sable himself, literally, um, the game itself is so pure, it's so innocent, and it never stops because there's so many people behind me, there's so many young people out there that I have to share the gift with, you know what I mean, to keep it going, and you're right. It doesn't matter the, the arena. I could be out in the street corner. Hey, right. come learn about these hands. You know who yeah. taught me? Uh, uh, Michael Sinclair. And, hey, I've, I've talked to Warren Sapp at extensive lengths about, you know, different ghost techniques and stuff like that. And, again, I love that Ask we're having this conversation right now. I love we're having Ask this conversation. Ask it on. Right? You got you to – that's the whole – that's the legacy to. aspect of it. And the, the beauty of education, which is something that, that – this, this particular point that I'm about to make is really important because I think so many people try to uh, – they, or they, they, they get – deterred or they get turned off or scared to get into education because they think that you have to have some level of of a degree or qualification to do it and the reality is you don't all you need is your your willingness to share your experience and that's been something that I've been trying to get my peers involved with forever for years I mean that's how Justin and I met was I was I had a 
a business that revolved around teaching and I was living and breathing it to, to, to try to get other people to do it. But the, the, the idea is everybody has something to offer. Everybody has their art and their talent. And if you don't share it, then it dies with you and you can't let others carry the torch that you don't allow others to carry the torch. And that I hate to say it is almost selfish because you're not going to be around forever. Why would you covet something like that when you have the opportunity and the platform to pass on the best aspects of your experience? So that's, you know, you mentioned like Justin that um, I gave a lot to you as a, as a teacher, right? That's right. the reason. And I've understood that for a long time because of my teachers telling me that mm -hmm. people being willing to take time out of their day to share their experience it's no joke and it's yeah. so easy to do <clears throat> for the reward that comes when you watch somebody get it. Yep. When they, when somebody else understands it and then develops their own way of using it and, and explaining it or, or sharing it with the world, there's no better feeling, you know, in terms of that kind of success. It's, 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 it's yeah, bar none. There's nothing like it. Well, I mean, in, you know, jump in if i'm off base here but i think i think the thing is you recognized in at least in me that i had a, a an earnest desire to learn and to yeah. actually apply it and then yeah. anytime i came to like i think one of the things that that you helped me learn that i think i i needed as a as a as a as a, as a human and as a musician you know, I would, I'm super competitive. I've always been very competitive and kind of like I heard you talking about an interview since I was, a, I was, I played my first gig on Christmas Eve at five years old in front of a thousand people at my dad's church. My dad's a pastor, uh, was a retired pastor. And, you know, I was from the time I was five years old, that is what I wanted to do. And, you know, I know you are kind of a similar way. You, you, you knew like, that's what I'm going to do right there. And, you kind of, inst when I went to that camp, you know, shout out to my, my buddy, Mike Moran. I still talk to Mike from that camp. You know, he's, he's got a great Instagram. Mike plays drums. Check it out guys. But, um, you, you can really encouraged, Hey, listen, you guys, there's plenty of room here for like, cause the, all the drummer egos can kind of come in here. Everyone's cool. Everyone can play, you know, collaborate, be cool with each other, be cool to other drummers and like, reach out more. And I just, it took me a while to get that to where now when I have some friends that are younger drummers, um, I'm like, Hey man, just get as much into info as you can play with as many bands as you can. And like when I was like 24, I didn't really get that 23, 24, you know? Uh, but now I, I get it. And I, so I think what you're saying there is, is so, so important. And I try to stress it all the time when we have, like I said, these guys like Mike Mangini come on the show who are just master, master level, not only educators, but just talent, you know, yeah. and they say this, they're all saying the same thing. And I think you also have the benefit of it's a much more, it's a mature view that, that people like, I mean, we all remember when you're that age, you're just like, ah, fuck, I know everything, man. You know, I was, I was, I don't think I was ever outwardly competitive, but I was definitely like secretly competitive as a drummer when I was, a, when I was a kid oh, yeah? through my teens, I wanted to, yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was better than everybody, you know, until I wasn't. And then it's like, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this dude's <laughs> been working way harder than me. And he, you know, it, or it's just, <clears throat> it was a, it's a, it's an experience that everybody has to go through in their own way. And when you realize what it is about, there is no room for competition in this, in this, uh, community of let's call it expression that we're in yep. because everybody's, like I said, everybody's got something to offer. And if you, if you spend your time, instead of thinking about how am I better than this for instead of that thinking, and what, what's the, what's the thing that I can learn from this person? What is the thing that they do that is just unlike anybody else? then you figured out how to approach learning. Yep. Well, it's that idea of mentorship, right? I mean, we like you, some people don't really, I don't think that's talked about in a open forum much because I think it's one of those things where 
people don't really think it exists, but it, it kind of takes a lot of different forms and it may take a form of like a teacher that you can get with one, you know, every now and then over the course of a couple of years or somebody that you work with or an older brother or whatever. But just that general idea of like taking somebody under your wing and eat is as much, like you said, it's a gift to have somebody give you their time and attention to, to help you, you know? Sure. And, and if you can be open to that and with as many people and the other thing that you said there it was stuck out to me, it was like, I can learn a lot from a lot of different people. You don't have to learn everything from one person. You can, Mm-mm. you can learn one thing from this guy and one thing from this guy. And there's I, people, you know, our listeners probably get tired of me saying some of the same things, but you know, I quote you all the time on that thing with the, with the conversation with the audience. And I quote Jamie King all the time about, you know, j- just do it, you know, like, um, but it's because I want people to hear that, you know, who may yeah. not have that opportunity to go have these experiences, especially now. Um, just take it from take it from Matt. You know he's he's got it figured out at this point. I don't know if I haven't figured out. I just you know I I've learned what um, what you can really accomplish when you are open minded mm-hmm. and and when you talk about even mentorship, uh, absolutely there are teachers that are that are going to to stand out in, in anybody's lifetime for whatever the thing they're learning. Uh, but you know it's funny. I try to find it everywhere I go. Yeah. everywhere. And, and I don't know if I look at it <clears throat> as mentorship. It's, it's not that formal of a, of a thing, but right. more so again, I think it's just open mindedness to like, okay, I may have a preconceived notion about this person, whoever they are. We, we oftentimes we all do this kind of like profiling thing where we look at somebody and we say, Oh, this is how they're going to be, or that's how they're going to be, or this is what the experience is going to be like. And it's easy to, to do that, but you kind of have to stop yourself from and, and ask yourself, well, do I know this person? And do I, have I had the experience with this person? And being open-minded, it's, yeah. it's just such a, so it's, it's such a better way to approach anybody because you start to learn really who they are pretty quickly. And, and, and if it's somebody who is willing to share, that's like, I mean, if someone's willing to share with you, you should absolutely listen because you never know what that one nugget of, yeah. of inspiration or knowledge or whatever it is is going to be that falls out of their mouth and it's like oh that's it fuck yeah i'm stoked this was worth this was worth the experience whatever it is you yeah. know I've, it's even like passing somebody on the street it's like when you you could learn from somebody to smile i know that's cheesy but it has an effect somebody it does especially when you're having a shitty day yep you know but like if you look at that for more than what it just what it is on at face value, if you're like, wait, wait a minute, that person smiled at me and it made me feel good. If I smile at the next person I see, they're going to feel good. This has been talked about millions of times, but it is a, it's the kind of thing that I'm talking about as far as being open-minded and willing to learn, like always having your antenna on and, and trying to receive the good shit and then also the bad shit. So you know what not to do and who to avoid. You know, who to, who to not let into your circle yep. kind of thing. Well, you know, we were just, we just had Andy McKee on and, um, oh, cool. one of the things we were talking about is like that first go around when you're a young musician and you're just like, Oh yeah, this guy's got a nice camera. Sure. Take my band photo. And then it turns out and you look like a total asshole or whatever. And like, there's that thing about being in a band where you gotta, you, you learn this skill of like working with other parties, right? You know, sound you're guys, never alone. You're never stage. Alone stage yeah. hands the person who pays you at the end of the night you know the guy at the van rental place like you, you start having oh yeah i know a guy for that i know a guy for this but when you don't at first it can be really taxing and like you're saying like it, there's like that fine line between like listening to everything everybody says and like hey being open that for there might be a nugget in here that i should so i'm gonna hear this person out you know um and that, again that's just stuff that you know you may not know when you're when you're 18 years old and you're starting your first band or whatever uh, that uh, you know I try to share because I wish I, w- I wish I could send some of these podcasts back to you know younger Justin that might might have helped. Well, you always bit. ask questions though. I, talking about you personally, you always ask questions. You you did show up for for multiple different learning sessions or lessons or whatever you want to call them. You you kept notes detailed enough with dates <laughs> and you know like that that. I think you're probably selling yourself a little bit short there because you did show up with questions, even if you felt like you weren't fully, you know, doing so 
it's obvious you were like, right. I mean, this is the first time and maybe it's, it, maybe it's something that nobody has just shared with me. But this is the first time that a student of mine has pulled out a journal with the date and the day and the time and been like, this is what you said at that day. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, what did I say? What did yeah. I say? What did I say? What did I say? You <laughs> are a fat asshole. I can't believe you said that. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, no, I mean, yeah, it's true. Well, I, I listen, man. I appreciate that. That's really kind of you yeah. to say. You know, no, uh, just, sure. because you know, not, not trying to turn this into a you know an old uh, classic tug fest here, but you know, I, if, if so, if I look at my life in like kind of two eras, there's like the the pre major health problem and then mm-hmm. the post and and then there was a drumming portion in the pre and a drumming portion in the post and if there was one drummer that i stole uh a lot of things from in the pre era it was mike portnoy and if there's one drummer that i stole a lot of things from in the post era it's you and um you know it's it's funny watching i was going back watching right. some older videos of you and i'm like oh yeah yeah i used, I used to use that a lot in the summer of uh, 2015 you know like there because you you're just you're one of those guys that when you when and I think part of it is, you know, when Periphery kind of had their big, when they first started to catch that momentum, that sound, that which is now that, that you know, whatever you want to call it, that, that down, down-tuned, you know, eight-string, seven-string guitar-driven music, um, that's now like a mainstream thing, um, yeah. which is fun. Uh, you were so different of a drummer, you, you still are, um, comparatively to all the other metal bands that were kind of in the scene and you had this different different guitar band and this different drummer and um it's it, that's why i think so many drummers like my age in that era and that group of music you know were just like oh yeah well, i'm gonna be matt halpern you know like you're one of those do you ever think about like how many you know indirectly you know there, there's like a whole generation of drummers that are you know wearing v-necks man yeah, I guess so. I, no, I mean, I, I I try not to think about that stuff because it like freaks me out, <laughs> to be honest. Really? Um, in a good way. I mean, I, you know, it's like shit. I have a lot of responsibility. These people, you know, these people look up to me, or they 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 saw something that I was just doing naturally, you know. And now it's like, oh shit, I have to I have to continue this. I have to I got to go make better videos and keep getting better and better and better. It's just it's like, all right, let's go. Yep. But. No, that's cool, man. I, I appreciate that. And, and I think it, again, it just goes back to what we were saying before, which is I just never grew up playing one style. And I just took all the things I learned from all the, the musical jobs I had and I applied it to the passion project, trying to give my all, because again, I don't need to, to, to be a, uh, a chameleon because I have to fit a certain role in periphery. I can just be myself and then play the music the way that each part inspires me. And in all in one song, I could be playing pop beats, rock beats, progressive beats, metal beats, double bass shit, blast beats, whatever, you know, and it's, just, I can do whatever I want, but it's all from that experience, you know? So I don't know, but I, but I will say, man, it's because I, I do run into a lot of drummers that never did other stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I had to support myself with music as well as other things when I committed to being in a band. You know, I didn't start Periphery when we were kids or like right out of high school and like we built up. Like I was a working musician for many, many years before I joined this band. And I had to make a decision to do that for my career and my life for many years before there was ever any promise of a serious band that was going to take me to all the places that periphery is taking me. There was no guarantee. And how it happened was a fucking fluke too. Yep. So it's, it's just, again, it goes back to deciding what I love and what I want to want to do, doing everything I have to do around that to support that, that habit of being a drummer. And then, <laughs> and then saying yes, like we talked about to the opportunities as they came about, even if I wasn't fully prepared, yep. it was worth the risk. Yep. And that's, that's, that's what I had to do. And so there's a, again, and just a lot of drummers that I'm friends with that guys that, you know, um, that you've worked with or, or talked to, or even had on the podcast who had a very different path than that. Some have had a very similar path, but some have literally been in bands out of high school or out of college and they just keep going. And that's where it is for me. It was never consistent like that until periphery when I was 20, 
Uh, how old am I? Uh, 26 is when I joined Periphery, 27. So I was doing a lot before then, you know? And, you know, I, I that's – it's funny because – when I when I was younger and I was inspired by you and in, in for for one set of reasons right maybe for for on a performance level and as I've gotten older and I've kind of become one of those like uh, I don't want to say jaded musicians but I've I've kind of experienced a lot of the things the ups and the downs you know that that one can experience as a as a professional and I know that you got a late your shot came late really you know mm-hmm. and. Uh, your your what really was your your shot I should say and yeah. y- you might think here's the thing here's the thing and this podcast is an example of that you know this was an idea I'd always wanted to get into podcasting we're going to talk about this kind of here in a second but it wasn't until I met Daryl and we started having these really in depth conversations and, and sharing our values with each other that I realized like oh wait a minute that's this is the podcast you know and then this this has really grown for us and now it's to the point where you know we're, we're we've got people in Finland that are waiting to hear that every week and it's like you oh, know it's beautiful. it's a, like yeah. like you said it's a it's a responsibility but it's also um it's a new it's, it's an avenue I didn't expect that was going to that was going to be a thing for me, you know? Yep. And, uh, yep. so you, you just never know what that one thing is going to be. And it might be when you're 30, it might be when you're 21, you just never, you never know. So like, you know, for me, don't, you just stay in the game, you know, you stay positive and you stay in the game. Eventually your number's going to get called. If you love it and it's what you want to do with your life, then why would you do anything else? Why would you, why would you rush it? I tell people that all the time, you know, like everybody wants to, get faster and do things faster and have instant gratification. But if, if it's with the thing you love, yeah, do it slow and like milk it for what it's worth and take advantage of the longevity that you can have with it instead of trying to just do the, the, you know, the overnight poof. It's like, yep. like I don't well, know. it takes I, 10 years to be an overnight success, right? Yeah. Some people even longer than that, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a treat. So as we start to wind down here, uh, I want to want to kind of hit 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 a different gear a little bit here. So, you know, I too, uh, you know, am a I'm a Joe Rogan fan, and when I see you uh, hopping into an ice bath, and then today on Instagram I see you got a sauna. I mean, I'm waiting for the bow hunting and the elk meat. I mean, what's <laughs> are you are you going full full Rogan on me here? What's going on, man? What's up? No, Tell me about the ice no, barrel. That's funny. No, I don't. I don't hunt. Um, I do have uh, a custom set of um, of uh, cornhole boards coming from a friend of mine who makes uh, cornhole boards and tar and axe targets. Ah. So the axe target might be next. Okay. We'll see. It's axe just I got, I got a little bit of space now to put it out back. So, but my neighbor is a cop. So he, I don't know if he's going to, he'll, he'll come, he'll probably come over and just start throwing all the axes. <laughs> anyway. But uh, he's a nutball man. I, I had a, I had just sidestep. I had some of my dad's rifles recently and I called over my neighbor and I was like, Hey man, check these out. Like, I don't know if they're still good. And it's amazing, man. Like he came over, he knew everything about these three different guns that I had in, in the garage that were my dad's. And I'm like, wow, you really are like a gun fanatic and a cop. That's awesome. Like he knew, he knew everything anyway. Hey, you never know. Note, you never know. Right. You never know. Yeah. No, he's, know. he's all, they're a great family. Great dude. Um, anyway, side note. Um, no, you know, it's funny, man. Like I haven't, I, I used to, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I used to listen to Rogan a lot more. I really don't listen to him much anymore. Not not because of any particular reason. I think I just started uh, kind of reading more than cut the middleman out. I, yeah, I just <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, if I am going to listen to podcasts, I really want to like. I either want to be scared, intrigued, or I want to laugh. And what I mean by that is like I listen to. Like Two Bears, One Cave with Tom Segura and Burt Kreiner. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite comedy podcasts. Or I listen to like Crime Junkies or something, you know, like something about murder and, and <laughs> com- you know, uh, mysteries and shit like that. Um, but no, I, look, the a lot of the stuff that I'm into. So sauna, I've been into sauna use for a lot of years now. Um, that was one thing that I did really start to learn from listening to Joe Rogan. Um, because at a point a few years ago, he was talking about how much he's using it. He's obviously had a lot of professionals like Dr. Rhonda Patrick Rhonda on the podcast. Patrick, yep. who talked, 
talks a ton about the benefits of sauna use. So I really subscribed to that pretty early on. And then I had known about Wim Hof and cold exposure for a bit. And I took some cold showers here and there. So I, I was just looking for ways to deal with anxiety and, and, you know, which is something I've dealt with my whole life. And, um, I, I got in, I didn't like, I've never been one to want to go into non holistic approaches, you know? So I just started doing a lot of research and reading and, and figuring out things that, that can really help. And I discovered breath work. Uh, I discovered various types of meditation and then I discovered cold exposure. And the reason why I felt like those four things, well, there's like a bunch, there's like five things, right? Meditation, sauna use for, um, you know, for, for the, the heat, the heat benefits, there's cold exposure, there's breath work, and then there's exercise, right? Physical exercise. Those five things, I have to hit them each day. That's, that's what matters the most in my day, aside from being a good husband and, and, you know, doing what I have to do. If I can hit even three of those five things, that's a successful day because each one is very good for my mental state. It's good for me physically. It's good for just being present, learning how to just, I don't know, like get, get deep and in touch with who I am and, and what I can face. That's why I've done all this stuff. I mean, because it, it, every single thing I just mentioned is a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge I can give myself every day. Getting in a cold, in an ice barrel is not enticing in and of itself. It's going to be miserable, right? It's cold. It's scary. But if I do it, that's a challenge I'm getting over. You start up it, with a, with one on the board. Right. And you, you know what? It's not that bad. In fact, I, I'm like addicted and I look forward to that challenge every day. Same thing with sauna use. It feels great for a little bit, but then when you get real hot, it starts getting miserable in a sauna and you, you know, it's, it's hard to stay in there, but you, you commit to certain things. Exercise, the same thing before we did this podcast, it had been such a busy day. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get a workout in, but I did, I hit the Peloton and even though I was tired and like, didn't feel like doing it, I forced myself mm -hmm. and I actually like, I, I hit a record, like a PR for myself of calories burned in 30 minutes. Right. Cause I pushed that hard. Cause I want to, I want to, I want to accomplish that stuff. Anyway, that's why I do all that stuff. Uh, that's there, awesome. and, and, and there's health benefits too. I mean, I had high blood pressure, cold, cold exposure, Great way to lower blood pressure. Sauna use, great way to lower blood pressure. Uh, and, and a number of other things. That's just one example. But dealing with anxiety, dealing with forms of sadness or depression or feeling like you're all over the place mentally, I'll mm. tell you what, you, you could take a cold shower or get in an ice bath, you can't think about anything else except that moment. And that is, that is the lesson mm. to deal with the present and deal with the cold and do it with peace and calm and collectiveness and just know that you can get through a tough moment while you're in it by slowing things down and breathing and just being present and, and not like getting overwhelmed by everything that's happening all the time. You know, that's, that's what it's about. That, that is what it's all about. And, and Matt, I think that's a great place to leave it, man. Thank you so much for being here yep. today, man, and sharing with us until we until we meet again. We didn't even get a, get a chance Thanks, again to get Matt. good drums and, and the podcast and everything great. So you we'll have to. Want, if you want to go for another 10 minutes, I can do it. Up to you if you want to dig in. Hey, <laughs> grab a paddle. Let's kick it. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's, so let's, let's, yeah. Dinner, so, dinner can wait 10 more minutes. All good. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. So yeah. I wanted to talk to you about uh, your podcast. So, so, so you're a man of many, uh, many hats, the Chocolate Croissant Podcast. Uh, it's one of your things, and, and I, I, I've been checking that out. I pop in on the lives every now and then on Instagram. Um, okay. How did you uh, find your way into uh, podcasting? It was – honestly, it was very, very unexpected and natural. I just – I was training with Justin, who's one of my po partners for the podcast. He's a physical trainer, dietitian. So I was working with him for a while, and we would train at his – he was living at his parents' house for a while, and his brother was living there, Jordan, who's the other partner in the podcast – and I'd be training with Justin and we'd finish training and we'd get into these deep conversations and then Jordan would come and sit down and we'd get in these deep conversations similar to what you guys were saying about this podcast. 
And we were just like, you know what, let's just record these. There's enough nuggets of information in here that we should be sharing <laughs> for anybody that wants to listen. Let's just do it. And then that's how it happened. And it, it, it was interesting because we got to about like 50 some episodes and then we stopped for over a year. And there was a number of reasons. One, we, we kind of approached it from, we, we tried to approach it like a business rather than just something that we all wanted to do for fun, uh, which, which definitely took its toll. And then we also all were just go, doing so many other things outside of it. It was really hard to fit it in and give quality, mm -hmm. uh, have quality conversations. So we took a break. And then as soon as COVID hit and everybody's spaced out, we were the first three people to like get together and just want to talk to each other, not yeah. even record it. We were like, Hey, let's, let's, let's bring this back. Let's have a conversation about where we're each at mentally, how we're dealing with this. Our listeners, you know, are still there. They, they want to hear from us. Let's, let's just share what we're going through. And then it's been much better since it's been way more authentic, way more about just having good conversations with friends, connecting with people, seeing how everybody is dealing with this situation. Uh, so that's what it's about, man. It's just, it's, it's a great way to, to learn again, learning from, from people that I respect and know and have great conversations with, with two friends of mine that have always offered interesting and very unique perspectives. It's it's amazing how that's how so how funny you know that that uh, your your pod origin story is similar to ours because it's really like I think once you understand the medium like yeah. partly from from consuming a lot of it and you realize how effective of a way it is to not only connect with people like on a personal level you know there's a podcast I listen to where um, like. I, I was on the road for work and I listened to it almost every day. And the one, one, uh, co guy who was on the show passed away and, uh, chef Carl Ruiz. And, um, it was like, whoa, like it really affected me because I listened to this guy. Like I felt like I knew him. Like I would, you know, I really had a connection to this guy by way of listening to his stories. And yeah, you're uh, right. I mean, you're there when you're in the car and listening to people talk, you are in that conversation. Yeah. And it's, it's, so when you kind of get that and then you're like, wait a minute, I've got some positive things I want to share and you have some other positive people together. Like it, it makes for, you know, a good, a good time. And, uh, it's, it's cool to hear that that's kind of your intention. And, and I, I totally get that from like, if you started as a business opportunity, like, I mean, kind of, it's kind of like music. Like if you don't have the passion for it, you're not going to be able to, it's going to be hard to do. Yeah. We just didn't know. I, we didn't know what we were doing and, and I, it, it wasn't as, clean and authentic from that perspective as I would would have liked it to be. But then again, you learn from it. We took the time off and we naturally came back to it without really any serious planning. And, and now we've all been really hooked on it again. And, and it's been very, it's been very refreshing to, to have this different perspective of it. And it's crazy. We're, we're on like episode 75 now, I think, or 76. So, you know, since COVID hit, we've done about 20 to 20, something like that, 20 more episodes and it's just been a breeze, you that's know, awesome. and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's really cool. cool. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, man, you've, you've had some, some big guests. I saw you had Donnie Wahlberg on there. I was, I watched that. Yeah. I was like, that was surreal. Like, and even, even for you, you guy that travels the world and you meet people that must've been like, Whoa, Hey, <laughs> that's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, well, he's dude, he's such a great guy. Yeah, it I, seems I, like I, it. I met him because him and his son are fans of the band, you know, it was such a cool experience to, to meet. And then, have them come out again and get to really know him. So it was a, it was a very cool thing to have him share his life perspective with our audience. And, and that's what I'm looking to do is just find people that, that inspire me and get them to, to contribute whatever they can to anybody who, who can listen, you know? So that's, that's what it's about. Sounds familiar, huh? DC. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey man, I gotta ask you one quick question. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about the cold exposure and the sauna use, like, do you do that in contracts? I know, like, we do that a lot, like, as, as athletes. But I just want to yeah. know, do you do it like back to back, or is it like how I does? Change, how does yeah, I change it up. I change it up. Um, certain days, I'll really uh, like I'll separate them and I'll just focus on, you know, the cold mostly, and then I'll use the sauna separately because I don't I don't necessarily want to warm up with help from a sauna, I want my body to warm up naturally for me, uh, for it, you know, it increases metabolism. It helps you burn fat. There's a number of reasons why you just let it warm up by itself best you can. But then other days I'll go back and forth between the two, 
um, not to throw out all these like terms, but I'm trying to develop vascular plasticity where you do <laughs> these back and forth sessions between sauna and cold and then sauna and cold, you know, heat, cold, heat, cold. Um, and it's just so good for, for your cardiovascular system. So I, I just change it up and I, and I don't want to actually get in too much of a routine to where my body gets used to any one combination. I want to continue to shock my system. So get those number, heat shock proteins, right? Well, yeah, and it, well, yeah, literally, exactly. But I also, I, you know, that's, it's funny. So I try to do a different workout every day. I never do the same thing. I try not to do the same thing twice. I always try to push myself a little bit further in one aspect of, of like, if I'm in the sauna one day and I'm just sitting there, then the next day I'll get in the sauna and I'll see if I can do, you know, a hundred pushups, uh, while I'm in there or, you know, I'll see if I can do breath work in there. I'll combine these different things so that every experience I'm, I'm focused on something different, but I'm also putting my body through something different. Uh, so it's, yeah, anyway, so there is, I, I do them all. I try to do them all every day, but in some different sort of combination is the answer. So you're huge on muscle confusion, body confusion. That's, that's awesome. I've just gotten into biohacking and, but, but in, I don't, I don't subscribe to every aspect of it. Like there's some really interesting kind of outlandish aspects of that. I've just really taken up the things that have been most appealing, most intriguing to me without going down the rabbit hole of every possible thing. Cause if you did everything, literally everything <laughs> that people tell you to do, you, you yeah. do anything else, you know? So just the things that have really worked and man, they work. They fucking work, you yes, know, they and, do. and I, can, I can only measure it by the way I feel physically and the way I feel mentally, but doing these, these putting, putting your body and your mind through these challenges every day absolutely will change you for the better. And it's it, with no doubt, like it, you can't not change for the better doing these things. I'll be, I'll be honest. I kind of want an ice barrel now. Well, so you and we can talk about this at the end, but you would ask you mentioned to me that you you do this thing where you ask somebody to tell you yeah you ask your guests like something yeah, about teaching yeah, the teaching every man. the everyman right so I th- I was thinking about what I want to share please so is now a good time for that because we can wait please. if you want to no okay. no 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 now's perfect time for you for you to do for you a little teaching the everyman all right so I've been getting a lot of questions since I started posting about the ice barrel about how long do you stay in and how cold is it and how do I do this. So the exclusive right here. Yeah. Right. Well, (laughs) there's way, way more people that have been doing a lot longer than me. But, um, from my experience, I, I have to say this with caution. I have been practicing and gradually building up to what I do now for months and months and months. And I started off the same way I'm going to teach to have everybody who is interested in this start off and it's not getting in an ice barrel. That's the thing. It's not. You can, you, I wouldn't recommend starting that way. If you do start that way, then you have to be very careful about starting that way. Um, so the thing that I would suggest to people, if anybody is interested in cold therapy, first off, let me say this. Go research Wim Hof. Okay? Learn about the breathing techniques. Learn about the cold exposure. Learn about the meditation that he does, the yoga that he does. Those are all things that you can apply to any aspect of what we're talking about that I do on a daily basis. And that's where I learned the bulk of it initially that got me started. So, you know, I'm going to plug that because he's an amazing human and he's an amazing teacher. And he's the guy who summited Everest barefoot. Yes. So yeah. just, just, I just was, I throw that out there. It was, I, I don't think it was barefoot, but it was in shorts for sure. Yeah. Just like I short. think most of it, he was barefoot. And then maybe at the top, he, you know, but it was, it's, it's, there's That's a documentary. Crazy. It. It's, it's yeah. insane. But you know what? I get it now. That's the thing. I get the, the, I get wanting that challenge. And I also can't wait for it to snow so I can walk outside barefoot and stand there in shorts and Fucking do Drago. breathing exercises and roll around in the, in the freaking snow. Rocky but, floor style. All right. Hit us with it. No, so look, if if you want to get into it, there's a lot that you can study for sure, and you should absolutely do your own research and look at look at look at the stuff that's out there. But start, you can start with Wim Hof for sure. There's a ton of information out there. But if you want to get into cold exposure, here's the here's the thing: take a normal shower, 
wash up, warm water, all that stuff, you know, hot water, do your thing. If you've never been exposed to cold before, the easiest way to do it is this. As you stand under the water, slowly and gradually turn the water towards cold. Go from hot to warm, stay in warm for a little bit, then go to lukewarm, stay there for a little bit, then you start to get a little bit more chilly, but not fully cold, stay there for a little bit, and gradually increase the level from warmth to cold, or decrease, I should say, from warmth to cold, if you look at it that way. And then, as you get closer to the full-on cold, it won't really be as bad at first, and you can really tolerate it, and you can slowly get into it. And then once you get it to fully cold, let it go for about 30 seconds, okay? So I would sing the chorus of um, Lizzo's, well, I'm in great, da, 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 da. that was the song, because <laughs> it was such a catchy chorus. I would sing that two times through, and I knew that was like 30 to 40 seconds roughly based on knowing that song, okay? So when I'm in the cold, though, I'm not hyperventilating, and I'm not shivering, and I'm not tense. The whole point is to relax your body to breathe normally and slowly and to move and like slowly turn so it hits your head, it hits your shoulders, hits your back. You want it to really hit every party. Don't just stand there like this under it and go like that. The, the goal is to try not to shiver, try not to breathe fast, try not to freak out. Go inside your body and say, oh, this isn't that bad. Like I can deal with the cold and I'm going to do it calmly. And if you can do that for about seven days every day, consistently every day, then you can graduate to the next step. But I'm not going to teach you the next step because if you do it for seven days and you like it, you'll be hooked enough that you will go find what the next steps are because that's how I did it and it's out there. But that's the thing. Don't start with a bunch of ice and an ice bath and don't jump in a shower, turning it to cold and just start cold. Take a normal shower, gradually get it to the cold. And then once it's all the way there, then 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it's all you need initially, and then go from there. So that's, that's what I got. Any questions? Well, I'll tell you, I'm glad, I'm glad that you uh, specified because I'm the kind of guy you say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'll get an ice bath. Next thing you know, I've got a 40-foot by 40-foot, you know, ice chamber. So, you know, like I just I take it all the way to the extreme. It's, it's a gift yes, and a curse. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just dangerous to do it the other way because, uh, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. that's the thing. That, that's what, like when you see people that fall in an ice lake, right? Um, they go into shock because they've never been exposed to so many different things before. It's mentally crazy. It's physically crazy. There's the risk of dying. I mean, you can get in an ice barrel and stay in for too long or too cold and get hy hypothermia and, you know, you're fucked. Yeah, so, especially if you're by yourself. So don't do that by yourself for the first exactly. time. Exactly. And, I mean, there's so many people with different conditions, and, and it's just you have to really do it. The one thing I forgot to mention that I want to make sure I mention is – while you're taking your hot shower, you should be thinking about that you're going to get in the cold. You're, you have to focus and, and prepare your mind so that when the fight or flight kicks in because the cold is so intense, you have control over it. And that's the whole point of this. It's to control the fight or flight mechanism, the autonomic nervous response in your body so that you have power over it instead of it having power over you and then potentially debilitating or killing you in certain situations. So by focusing and preparing for what's to come, you're telling your body not to have this response so that you can control it naturally and then you build up this amazing superhuman ability to withstand all sorts of crazy shit. And that's, that's the whole point. So life in a anyway. nutshell right there. That's sweet. dude. That is Matt, sweet. Now that, now that is, is a, is a place to end it. Matt, <laughs> thank you so much, brother. Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's thank been a pleasure, brother. man. And, yeah, uh, sure. you know, we'll, we'll have to do this again soon.